Okay, everybody. Okay, everybody. Uh, th thank you, thank you all for coming. We're we're delighted to have you here. Uh, my name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president here at CSIS, and it's a real privilege to welcome all of you this morning, and a very special privilege to be able to uh, introduce uh, Kevin Rudd, who's going to be kicking this off. I. Uh, two nights ago, uh, I had a remarkable experience. I was in a, in a meeting with, with uh, Prime Minister Rudd, and uh, he took us on an absolutely remarkable discussion about Asia, the rise of China, the tensions between our two countries, uh, the United States and China, the implications for all, both of us and for the region. It was just remarkable. And, you know, in my professional life, I've been around uh, politicians, for 40 years, I've been around. Yeah, I've been around analysts for now for 15 years in this sort of environment. But I've never been in this kind of a experience before. You know, for someone who can walk you into a new space intellectually and help you understand the significance of that space and also its political importance. This is this is un, this is rare. Uh, I've. I've been with politicians who, when explained the significance of something, will figure out the politics. You know? And I've been with analysts who understand the significance and don't have a clue how to think about it politically. You know? But very, very rarely. And the only other person, frankly, at, at my experience like, it was like this was, was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had that capacity to walk you into an intellectual place you've never been before and help you perceive its enormous significance and its political import. And Kevin Rudd can do that uh, brilliantly. And so I, uh, when we asked him if he, would, if he would come and join us today, it was, uh, it was an extra hope and we're very grateful that he was willing to do it. Of course, the topic is something that he focuses on personally uh, all the time. Uh, Prime Minister Rudd is is currently, he's affiliated with CSIS, and we're very proud of that. He's a distinguished statesman here at CSIS. Uh, he's also at, at Harvard, uh, where they get the, more of his time than I wish, uh, and I'm, because I'm jealous. Uh, but, but he is willing to come here and has been very, very helpful and supportive of us in thinking through these complex issues. He is going to give all of you that opportunity today, uh, because you're going to have a, 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 a rich opportunity for something that's unique. And so would you, with your applause, please welcome Kevin Rudd, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you, John, for that um, great exercise in expectation management. Uh, the, um, I will not produce magic this morning, and there will be no song and dance show. Uh, the, um, but I do appreciate the hospitality of CSIS, and I acknowledge the work which it does, uh, not just on behalf of the United States, uh, but by all uh, individuals around the world who take the disciplines of foreign policy, uh, international relations, and strategic policy seriously. Uh, it is a first-class institute, and it brings together first-class minds, which I presume is why all you folks are here this morning. Uh, secondly, uh, you made reference, reference uh, John, to uh, my time at the um, uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, after I came second in the national elections in Australia last um, uh, September, which is a polite way of saying that I lost, um, the uh, Harvard guys kindly picked up the telephone and asked me to go to the Kennedy School to think. Uh, having been in politics for 15 years, that's not really been my business for the last 15 years but to think, uh, and to think about alternative futures for US-China relations. Um, and in particular, whether in fact there is a way through some of what we who have professionally followed this for many years regard as some of the in intractables in that relationship. And uh, Harvard Kennedy School has been very supportive of my work on that, and I've spent a lot of time talking to think tanks in Washington, think tanks in Beijing, think tanks in um, Tokyo, and uh, think tanks in uh, Delhi and Singapore and Moscow uh, on these questions, as well as uh, officials from those governments as well. 
Of course, uh, given the topic that we have been set this morning, which is about uh, questions of future regional architecture, China does not constitute the totality of that picture, nor does, nor does the China-US relationship constitute the totality of that picture. So in my remarks here this morning, having been invited to do this only two days ago, uh, let me uh, seek to stand back <clears throat> and uh, look at the trends at work as I see them across uh, the Asia-Pacific region. Um, secondly, what's going well. Uh, thirdly, what's not going so well. Fourthly, um, uh, where does the China-US relationship fit within that for the future? And some final remarks on questions of architecture. If you stand back and try and look at uh, the events in the Asia-Pacific region, we tend to think that uh, we uh, are unique in terms of those factors which are affecting uh, the global business of international relations. Uh, we are not unique. The factors at work in the international community, in my view, are largely comprised of two deep underlying forces which we in the policy making business or the policy advising business need to be conscious of. One is this overwhelming uh, dynamic of what we call globalization. Um, we use the term a lot, we often use it glibly, but the sheer manifestation of it in that which we say and do every day and how we perceive one another is profound. Of course, the general uh, turbocharging of globalisation as we define it by the new technologies are simply compounding and quadrupling and mutating, um, whether it's in financial markets or in economic exchanges or, frankly, in the resources available to terrorist organisations. And so the verities we began talking about a decade or so ago are now actually intensifying in their scope. And the overall dynamics of globalization at the economic level and at the social level, and to some extent at the cultural level, has been over the last 20 years or so, since the end of the Cold War in particular, uh, to draw uh, peoples, cultures, countries, nations, and even governments somewhat closer together simply as a product of the dynamic. Um, and this is uh, a virtually an unprecedented phenomenon in global history, in terms of its intensity, its density, its complexity. But over well, overall, a uh, force for the good. And then pitched against it, of course, is a second set of forces which simultaneously acts in reaction to it and seeks to pull nations apart, either internally or um, between one another. And these I could broadly describe as the forces of ethno-nationalism or simply nationalism. Anyone who thinks that uh, we have somehow mysteriously extinguished the forces of nationalism as a consequence of rational economic man ruling the world or rational economic woman ruling the world is deluding themselves. You simply have to be a political practitioner engaged in the business of democratic politics in your own country to know that is not the case. But as you travel extensively across Asia, the nationalist agenda in each country is palpable and it's real and it's visible and it's uh, tangible and it actually shapes deeply uh, the thinking of most political elites. Of course, if you dig into that deeper, what is this ethno-nationalist reaction, whether it's what we see in Europe, uh, what we see uh, in um, various extreme forms uh, in uh, the new phenomenon we observe in the Middle East, or in some of the emerging and intensifying security challenges in East Asia, is that ethno-nationalism often uh, is a deep reaction to the uh, phenomenon of globalization and the depersonalizing dimensions of, of uh, globalization. And what actually happens in response to that is those who don't, lose, don't win from the globalization project economically, or those who lose their identity as a consequence of the globalization project, obviously feel threatened alienated and threatened, and they therefore congregate around concepts and ideas and political movements which are about identity, locality, and ethnicity. It's palpable, it's real, and it doesn't matter which country or which society you're talking about. The task, therefore, of national, regional, and international leadership at present is to navigate the shoals uh, which are constructed by those two underpinning deep geoeconomic and deep geopolitical forces and they animate uh, the fundamentals of the, what I describe as the technical foreign policy debates uh, which we have on a day-to-day -day basis in the uh, foreign policy community.
Secondly, when we turn to how this great drama of globalization on the one hand, pulling countries and cultures together versus ethno-nationalism simultaneously tearing them apart or threatening to tear them apart, the central question for the politics of Europe and the politics of Asia and the politics of the Middle East is who will win, uh, the forces of globalization or the forces of ethno-nationalism. How this uh, grand debate is resolved uh, globally and regionally is of profound significance for the future of the 21st century. Uh, when we look at the European project up until now, we can only be but in admiration of what they've achieved coming out of the ashes of the Second World War. Mindly, mind, mind you, and without giving unnecessary offence to our European colleagues here today, the Europeans were very slow learners, having torn each other apart in three major conflagrations within 75 years from the Franco-Prussian War through to the Second World War. Um, they finally concluded that there are better ways of doing business. And the political architecture of emerging um, uh, Europe, first the market, then the community, and then the union, was very much a political construct seeking to deal with the underlying forces of ethno-nationalism which had effectively destroyed the continent uh, over that scope of time. Come to our part of the world, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, in the period since, in, since the fall of Saigon in 1975, really through until very recently, if you were to look at a 35-year sweep, uh, the globalization project in, let's call it, the Asian hemisphere has proceeded remarkably successfully. Uh, we've had no major conflicts within the hemisphere. Uh, we have produced phenomenal economic growth. We have produced extraordinary increases in living standards, unparalleled in human history and the numbers of people that have been drawn out of poverty. And as a consequence, a dynamism to the uh, intra-regional discourse within uh, wider Asia that we hadn't seen before either. Uh, those uh, Westerners looking on uh, to the phenomenon called uh, Asia, uh, which is a European construct in itself when you think of the term, Asia meaning the east, east of where, presumably London, Paris or Berlin or Rome. But if you look at what is unfolded in Asia itself, it's the internal dynamics which have generated so much of the wealth, the prosperity and the success. Um, and the external dynamics with the extra-regional partners um, has also been important, particularly the relationship with this country and its massive market, the United States. But the intra-regional dynamics have been extraordinary to unfold and overwhelmingly positive, and to the mutual benefit of all countries within the region. And that has been, I think, so much the story over the last uh, 35 years. But again, to simply sound the alarm, uh, to conclude from that, that the uh, forces of uh, nationalism and ethno-nationalism uh, or religious nationalism in certain cases have simply evaporated and died is simply uh, a false analysis. And the battle royale within uh, the region and for its future will again uh, centre around how these two conflicting forces are contended with. Uh, forces of globalisation intensely drawing this region together and forces of nationalism seeking always to tear the region apart and sometimes tear nation states apart. So the report card for the last 35 years has been quite reasonable. Then in the last several years, uh, we begin to scratch our heads and ask what is happening. And it is a complex and variable picture across the region. Uh, we often forget the ancient lessons of international relations history that uh, mutually agreed territorial boundaries help in the business of international relations. Uh, this is often seen to be an old concept of old realisms belonging to the verities of ancient international relations and not really relevant to the borderless world of the 21st century, to which I would respond with the great observation of Australian philosophy, pigs might fly. Um, it's alive, it's well, and it's a driving factor uh, in the analysis of these questions uh, to this very day in the Asia-Pacific region. You know the fault lines within the region as well as I do, but if you go simply on a mental map tour of the region, starting with the Korean Peninsula, a divide and a state of war which existed still since 1953, uh, through to the uh, East China Sea uh, and Sankoku, uh, Diaoyu Dao, 
uh, and you look at uh, the unresolved uh, questions which still remain between uh, China and Korea and between Japan and Korea. Uh, if you look at the, the complexity of uh, what constitutes the South China Sea and all of the um, uh, dimensions of the conflicting territorial claims involving seven different entities, uh, before you then flip around uh, and uh, head through the Straits of Malacca uh, onto uh, the unresolved uh, questions of India, Pakistan and Kashmir, and then further afield to what is now unfolding uh, in terms of militant Islamism not far to the northwest of there. Uh, all of these factors exist not just in theory and on paper, but are capable of, in fact, bringing about um, a conflagration at any given point through poor issue management and the normal politics and dynamics of escalation, which unfold as a result. And so in the last three years or so, we have seen uh, these um, unresolved issues come much more sharply to the surface. Which brings me to my fourth point about how, in fact, uh, this is to be dealt with uh, in the future and whether or not the US-China relationship is central to most of it. I know enough about the um, politics of Southeast Asia to know that the China-US relationship is not central to everything. Um, it is um, a, an important dynamic, but what occurs within Southeast Asia is uh, primarily conducted uh, intra-regionally. And to any uh, folks from the ASEANs here today, I would simply commend the ASEANs on how they've managed their own regional evolution over the last 40 years. It's been an extraordinary uh, development, and I think a lesson to the wider region. But when we then extend the map more broadly across East Asia itself, then it's very difficult to escape the central organizing dynamic of the uh, China-US relationship in its current state and where it may evolve in the future, which is why I've taken a year out at the Harvard Kennedy School to look at it more closely. So let's look for a moment uh, at uh, its uh, dynamics. Uh, if you were to take an objective measure about US-China relations over the last 35 years since normalization in 79, and look at the ebbs and flows of that relationship since, on any objective analysis, if you arrive from the moon, you would have to conclude the relationship isn't in a bad state. There is no immediate palpable sense of crisis in any particular element of the relationship. However, when you look at the perceptions which are emerging from within both, within both the Chinese leadership uh, and within uh, parts of the um, American foreign policy establishment, uh, it is much uh, less settling than that. Let me speak about the Chinese perceptions first. The best I can describe China's current perceptions of the United States at the most senior leadership level is that they uh, have concluded internally that it is virtually impossible to develop a long-term strategic relationship with the United States based on mutual trust, mutual strategic trust. Um, and I believe that um, they articulate this um, in a number of ways. They articulate this by saying that um, they believe that uh, the United States is in the business of isolating China, um, the United States is in the business of uh, containing China. The United States is in the business of diminishing China. China. The United States is in the business of delegitimizing China. The United States is in the business uh, of ultimately seeking, by indirect means, to destabilize the Chinese leadership. Uh, these things are never said in polite conversation, which is presumably why they've asked an Australian to speak to you this morning. <laughs> We've never majored in politeness. Um, but I think at this stage of this very important relationship, uh, China and the United States, uh, it's important we have some very clear baseline reality checks about where things actually lie in Chinese perceptions. So let me flip the table in terms of American perceptions of China. And I think this is very important because uh, the level of misperception is profound and, I believe, growing. Uh, I think the American um, uh, perception of China, and I don't seek to describe any official here, it's simply my observation of the general foreign policy establishment, uh, is that uh, China for the American and the global interest is important economically, 
uh, that the Chinese political system, however, is inherently unstable and unsustainable. And the American perception is that China is pursuing an assertive form of nationalism to mask uh, its own internal uh, political vulnerabilities um, and is seeking, therefore, to change the status quo across um, uh, the rest of East Asia over time. Firstly, by means of the economy, uh, to economically overwhelm the rest of Asia, and then in, in time, diplomatically and then militarily. Um, and furthermore, uh, deep American perceptions which raise this question about whether Chinese diplomacy is in fact simply pitted at buying time while the overall correlation of forces moves more profoundly in the direction of one which economically and militarily advantages China before China more overtly and directly then acts to assert its position of uh, preeminence within the region. Again, that's never said in polite society either, um, because um, these things are not the business of day-to-day -day diplomacy. But if you get around think tank land uh, a lot, and you get around governments a lot, you pick up tonalities in respective capitals, and I don't think those generalizations that I have just made are enormously wide of the mark, that is, represent large departures from reality. Of course, others uh, seek to try and be objective about all this, and anyone who claims to be perfectly objective is engaged in complete self-delusion as well, because we all see uh, reality through our own prisms, whether we're conscious of that or not. And we Australians are no different. The only advantage we Australians have, I think, uh, is that at our best, which is not always the case, uh, we are both the West in the East and the East in the West. And that is, we uh, are long-standing and deep allies of the United States, for which we make absolutely no apology. At the same time, with all the countries of East Asia, and including the People's Republic of China, Republic of China we've had a deep, comprehensive, profound, long-standing relationship. Um, and if you look at public attitude surveys in Australia, uh, the United States is very well-liked, and China is quite well-liked. And so there's actually a deep attitudinal basis to th this in my country as well. So we cannot pretend to be objective because uh, we're US allies on the one hand, um, uh, but at the same time strong and close um, friends with our uh, counterparts in Beijing on the other. What I've concluded about these different sets of perceptions uh, is that um, uh, a large proportion of them, but not uh, in their entirety, uh, do, not res do not reflect uh, the objective reality. And to give one example in both directions. On the containment question, um, if we define containment as that which was used by the United States against the Soviet Union during the period of the Cold War, what we see in terms of America's current operational policy towards the People's Republic of China cannot be faintly described as containment. Um, it has none of the characteristics of classic containment. Um, that might be a useful political rhetorical line to be used in the debate, but in the days of containment, there was virtually no economic engagement between America and the Soviet Union, and any Soviet action anywhere in the st strategic regions of the world of relevance uh, to the United States, uh, which was everywhere, was met with an equal and opposite reaction. Um, in one form or another by overt or covert means. That is not the case in the US-China relationship. It's of a vastly different character. And so we need a more textured understanding in Beijing as to what the nature of US operational policy is. Uh, but the term containment uh, is not accurate, and in my judgment, uh, can lead to erroneous policy conclusions in Beijing. Now let me flip the tables again in terms of what I think is um, uh, erroneous American perceptions of China. When China in its tradition and its current leadership constantly say, uh, we as a civilization have never been in the business of establishing overseas colonies when we had the national capacity to do so, and therefore we have no such interest again in the future other than to engage the world uh, commercially, I think that's about right. Uh, when you look at China's history, uh, from the Ming Dynasty to the present, so many of the animating forces in Chinese history have been how to deal with its profound domestic agenda, which have 
almost overwhelmed every successive generation of Chinese leaders. How do you feed a quarter of humanity? How do you manage the politics of a quarter of humanity? Uh, how do you deal with its current manifestations in terms of uh, the impact on air pollution, uh, water quality and the rest? My overall point therefore being that in the case of um, uh, the uh, perception that our Chinese friends are in the business of incrementally seeking to uh, create a, uh, a form of uh, Chinese neo-colonialism in parts of the world I think is profoundly wrong. It is not consistent with the tradition and it's not consistent with the characterization of uh, actual Chinese behavior on the ground. So where do we go from here? And I'll conclude on these remarks. Given the centrality of this relationship, I believe both uh, governments and the region more broadly because of the centrality of the relationship to the region's wider stability and frankly the rest of the world as well as we move into uh, the unfolding decades of the new century. Uh, the China-US relationship is in deep need of a new narrative, a common narrative. Um, and here I don't simply speak in terms of um, some form of foreign policy utopianism or some sort of um, academic seminar. Um, that's not helpful. I think you need a framework which in somehow, some way responds to the idea which uh, Xi Jinping put forward about a new type of great power relationship. And if you understand, I think, why President Xi put that forward, it was how do you construct a relationship between China and the United States which doesn't rep replicate the inevitability of conflict as we've seen in the history of great powers before. Beyond that, I think President Xi's concept is basically a headline waiting to be populated. Um, it is an idea, it is a line, it is a sentence. Uh, but if you go to Chinese think tank land, as I do very often, um, the actual internal content of this proposition is uh, very fluid um, indeed. So what could a possible common narrative look like? Well, um, this is a very complex question. Um, but um, I would leave you with two or three thoughts. A common narrative between China and the United States is important for the reasons I've just mentioned, that at present I think both countries have narratives about each other, but not a common narrative for both of them. The Chinese have many narratives about, um, about uh, the United States, most of them not publicly articulated, and the same in the reverse direction. So what, given all of that, uh, is possible in terms of a common narrative for the future? I think it requires what I have described uh, most recently as a concept of constructive realism. Um, and a con concept of constructive realism which builds towards a concept of a common future. That's a word about each of those words. Realism, if you spend enough time in this town um, and you've studied US foreign policy uh, in its um, 20th century history, this is a deeply realist foreign policy establishment and for entirely understandable reasons. Um, and when you look at the school as it's evolved here at a theoretical level from Morgenthau to the present, uh, it is rich and it's deep and it's reflected in the behavior of practitioners. Um, in China, um, realism, called by various different things, is equally apparent, equally uh, part of the Chinese um, tradition of understanding uh, foreign policy engagement. And for every uh, Morgenthau, there are probably 10 Chinese equivalents. So there is a deep realist foundation to the way in which both countries view each other which has um, all sorts of potential difficulties arising from that of itself in terms of the expiration of mutual trust before a chance is even given in the first place. But given this is such a profound reality in both conceptual hemispheres in Washington and Beijing, it has to be acknowledged. And there are real and objective, continuing, uh, conflicting interests and conflicting values between China and the United States, of which the territorial issues that I've just mentioned in the East and South China Seas are but one manifestation. These need to be accepted, explicitly recognized, but critically managed uh, in a manner which concludes that allowing any one of these matters to escalate into crisis, conflict of war is mutually unacceptable.
That's the realist part. What's the constructive part? The constructive part is this. If you look at the possibility of constructing genuine public goods between China and the US, both bilaterally, regionally and globally, the scope is in fact quite wide. If you look at it bilaterally, I'm a strong proponent to the early conclusion of the Bilateral Investment Treaty, but for a simple reason. Uh, and that is, the more the two economies become in, enmeshed through investment, uh, rather than just through trade, then frankly, the more inseparable they become and the more the mutual interests in each other's progress and advance uh, becomes an indelible imprint uh, within each country. So causing that investment treaty to come into being, I think, is a genuine public good because it, in the long term, will transform many elements of the relationship. Um, regionally, and I will touch on this in my concluding remarks, there is, I think, a value to be had in uh, both governments, together with those of the region, beginning to evolve further the region's existing architecture. Uh, the existing architecture has served the region reasonably well, but it's thin. APEC has performed a valuable role in opening economies internally and to one another across the region. Uh, if you look at the tentative moves in terms of a more geopolitical and or sec national security related discussions, there's been some contribution by the AF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, a nascent contribution by the East Asia Summit, but frankly, this needs to be taken further. Why would both countries be interested in that? I don't think either Beijing or the United States want to trip casually by accident or poor incident management into crisis, conflict or war. So therefore what you need is an institution such as those we've seen evolve in Europe over a long period of time, and I emphasise evolve over time, um, which begin to create basic confidence and security building measures uh, between um, not just those two countries but the other regional participants. And over time to begin to evolve through that sort of head of government level regional discourse, a nascent sense of common security rather than divided security. This does not replace the alliance structure, it supplements the alliance structure. And of course, uh, international models such as those offered by the European Union are not readily applicable. But the idea and the concept and frankly the achievements uh, which we can attribute to the Europeans should be borne in mind. And this would constitute, in my view, a genuine regional public good. And finally, a global public good. The extraordinary turnaround in China and US postures on climate change uh, is for me um, one of the great unwritten positive stories of the last few years. Having been a participant in the Copenhagen Summit on Climate Change in 2009, and having not slept for two days and seen uh, that particular attempt to get a global climate change treaty advanced uh, in the face of much intransigence from the governments I've just mentioned, um, was, I believe, a tragedy. But what's fundamentally changed since then is a 180 degree shift in Chinese policy. And the ability, therefore, for President Obama and President Xi to advance the global commons, a global public good, by making new national commitments on climate change, I believe is a real element in the trust building exercise. Which brings me to the final element of the equation. First, the foundation is realist. Secondly, if you like, um, the superstructure is uh, constructive. What can we do together in areas where the interests are sufficiently overlapping or the values are sufficiently overlapping? And the third element is, over time, having a concept that you can harness the political and uh, diplomatic capital from these areas of common cooperation uh, to, in fact, deal with the underlying fundamental objective realist problems that I referred to at the outset, which constitute the constant source of friction. At present, there's not a whole lot of diplomatic and political capital to draw upon. Uh, in terms of dealing with the hard issues. But by virtue of a process which deals with things like a bilateral investment treaty, things like uh, a, an, a new evolution of the region's architecture, things like uh, global um, advances on climate change driven by these, the two largest emitters in the world, but in time also on intractable questions like North Korea and cyber security and also the rise of militant Islamism there is a basis to construct a new element of um, evolving strategic trust between the two, which provides a platform for dealing with the unresolved deep challenges of the future. I conclude my remarks with how I concluded them here two nights ago. Deng had this great saying, 
uh, about the Chinese domestic reform process. Uh, what Deng said was that, this is way back in the late 70s, that if you want to reform this thing called China uh, in the great uh, openings of, um, of a new policy, economic reform domestically, opening to the outside world internationally, uh, then um, it's going to be a long process. And so he used this marvellous analogy, which is you cross the river steps, feeling the stone step by step. I think we also need to have that concept alive in our minds about how you can possibly engineer that incremental trust-building exercise between China and the United States as well. Step by step, but knowing in fact that there is a destination called the common future. For our Chinese friends here in the audience today, if you're talking about realism, means something in the Chinese context. If you're talking about a constructive approach, jian shi xing or jian shi is a positive term in the Chinese context. Um, and a gong tong wei lai, uh, or guo ji gong tong ti, not gong gong ti, but uh, gong gong champion, uh, international glo <coughs> or global public goods, it means something in the Chinese discourse. So to frame a common vision, to frame a common concept, but not to leave it at a level of political theory, but to then have an operational dimension which can be put into practice by regular summary between the two countries. Uh, that, I think, provides us a way to navigate our way through. If we don't, then I fear that the tendency will be towards inertia, drift, and drift becoming current, and perhaps in a, in a direction which none of us would want to see for the future. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rudd. And I would like to uh, open the floor to uh, some questions. That, I'll, if I could, maybe I could start with with one. And and the question is this: Do you think that um, American or Chinese uh, economic strategy uh, is sufficient? given the, the broad scope of the region that you described to us. Uh, what advice would you have for both countries uh, in that area? Well, the, the, the wisdom of foreign policy is never provide public advice to any government. Um, it's usually likely to be unwelcome. Private advice is usually um, of a different nature. But let me make some broad observations. And that's looking at from the region out rather than from America or China in. There are some basic metrics here. Metrics, while boring, are important. Um, you know, China, as of 2000, the last couple of years, has become the world's largest trading power. It's become the world's largest exporter. It's the, second, the world's second largest importer. Um, and if you were to put together simply on trade metrics, um, China today is the number one trading partner of about 127 countries around the world, the United States about 73. Uh, depending on who you believe, the World Bank, the IMF, um, or uh, whichever journalist just wrote an interesting story, uh, and again, the measures of the relative size of the Chinese and American economies, uh, purchasing parity, pricing, or market exchange rates calculations, and what the price assumptions are of PPP, the, the Chinese economy is projected by a combination of the bank, the IMF, uh, and or the OECD to be larger in size than the uh, American economy somewhere between 2015, 2014, 15, and 2024, 2025. The metrics are really important here. If you are looking at it from the region out, the economic significance of China, both in terms of trade, FDI, and prospectively, depending what happens with the liberalisation of the, of the renminbi in the future, capital flows becomes a much more dominant factor in the economic reality of uh, East Asia than America. I don't think um, people have quite thought that through in terms of where it all leads, but if you take as your primary assumption that from economic power, other forms of power proceed, there is a fundamental underlying shift occurring across the Asian hemisphere. That in turn, of course, in terms of its forward trajectory, goes to questions like the sustainability of Chinese growth over time, goes to the questions of will the growth rate be 7.5, 6.5, or the most negative projections in terms of averaging over the next decade down to something just north of three or early four. Um, 
So there are a whole series of assumptions uh, which go to uh, how you project, but the projections both by the bank uh, and the fund and the OECD do not assume linear projections. So all I'm saying is, as a question of basic economic metrics, China is now more relevant to the economies of East Asia than the United States. Now that's a very thin margin at present, but as you see the investment flows unfold, and you see the capital flows unfold depending on regulatory changes in Beijing, that equation is going to change even more profoundly. Um, it's up to the United States um, to uh, respond to that as they so choose. But that is an unfolding reality in our part of the world. Uh, Hugh White is here with us from Australia. If you took the China trade uh, out of the Australian GDP, Hugh, I presume the China trade now would represent imports, exports, about 7% of Australian GDP? Now, that's quite a lot of cash for any economy, and we're, what, a $1.6, $1.7 trillion economy. So replicate that across the economies, smaller economies of Asia, and we're the fourth largest economy in Asia after China, Japan, and India. This equation is unfolding. And so part of the American response is the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the diplomacy associated with that, um, and for which there is a Chinese counter-narrative as well. I won't go into the probabilities and relative merits of both proposals. Let me open it up for one or two questions. Uh, Andre? Straight here in the middle, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm um, Andre Sobajo, and I'm the uh, chief representative in Vietnam for the Interstate Traveler Company. And uh, it was a wonderful address. Thank you so much. So comprehensive. Uh, I, I just taking notes from your remarks, sir, and the only thing that I have a question on is in working towards this constructive realism, great term, and you defined it well, uh, but it seems like a fly in the ointment, so to speak, is that... It seems like a what? Uh, 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 the a fly main in the obstacle, the main obstacle to working towards constructive engagement with all those variables is that of all the parties to the equation, only China, only China, continues to violate using violence to intrude into the exclusive economic zones of, you know, uh, the Philippines and Vietnam and other countries, and deny that they're doing it. And I've been on business trips and I've seen them come right into the exclusive economic zone and use, using violence. So what... I think the truth of all this is, just to paraphrase, because I'm conscious that you've got a rest of a program to attend to and I've got to be out the door in a minute, but I get the question. I think if you were to go through the analysis of each of the um, uh, disputes uh, from north to south, each has its own internal characteristics. If I was an international lawyer sitting at the International Court of Justice on each of these disputes and where the territorial lines lay, I would probably have different resolutions on each of them. <clears throat> and having spent some time looking at the underpinning legal cases concerning Sankoku Diao Dao, um, concerning uh, Spratley's parasols and the intervening seas and the claimant positions of uh, all seven parties. This is a highly variable feast. It's not just that we as an Australian government have traditionally chosen to be neutral on this. There is a reason to be neutral and that is that the um, underpinning legal cases are, if they ever came to jurisdiction, are so complex. So if we had another hour, we could go through each of these individually, but I think that would um, uh, be tiresome for people in this gathering. And so rather than have an adjudication which says who's right and who's wrong in each one of these disputes, I simply point to the fact that China now has a more, and deliberately more uh, activist, proactive foreign policy and direct pursuit of its interests, and has been the case for at least the last year or so for those who observe these things closely. It proceeds from a series of perceptions within the Chinese leadership about the United States, which I sought to articulate before. Therefore, the concrete policy challenge is, what do we do in response? Um, and that's what I have uh, sought to articulate today. I'm sure in the rest of your conference, you'll have an opportunity to dissect uh, each element uh, of each dispute, uh, but that is um, not possible right now. Andrew, your associate professor at Catholic University. Uh, you mentioned that the... the Which university are you? Catholic University. It's okay. in Northeast D.C. Uh, as, you, as in Holy Mother Church, that Catholic? Uh, yes. 
Okay. No, um, <laughs> you mentioned that the rhetoric of containment is, uh, is a misnomer, it's a misperception of the Chinese. How would you persuade to the Chinese that the strategic, the U.S. strategic rebalance to Asia is not a form of hard containment? Well, again, it goes down to the whole question of definitions of containment. I mean, um, the alliance structure in Asia has existed, as you know, um, since the 40s and the 50s. Um, and was primarily constructed in those days with principal reference to, uh, firstly, a research in Japan in the case of the Australian alliance, and then latterly in terms of the Soviet Union. So the alliance structures have long existed. There's often a long discourse about uh, more Marines going to Darwin. Well, you know, there used to be one and a half thousand Marines coming each year for three months. Now we've got two and a half thousand Marines coming each year for six months. Well, I would say hold the next edition of the um, strategic balance put out by the IISS in London because that fundamentally alters the global strategic equation. It doesn't. Um, it's kind of a normal evolution of, of alliance arrangements which actually have multiple applications. So again, I go back to definitions of containment. Um, it doesn't actually fit the term. Um, there are probably other terms which are better used in the international discourse to describe US strategic responses to China, but containment is not one of them. If you are looking at the classic definition of it, uh, uh, as framed by Kennan and the others in this town in the uh, late 40s. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking uh, Mr. Kevin Rudd. If you just hold your seats, we will have the next panel uh, come up. Thank you very much. Good morning, and let me add my welcome to you uh, to uh, the CSIS Asia Architecture Conference. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm the program director for the International Business Program here at CSIS. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate our first panel today, uh, which is uh, going to cover the economic issues in uh, the, uh, that will be uh, on the table and, and as part of the conversation in the East Asia Summit and the APEC Leaders Meeting. Uh, it uh, strikes me that, you know, for the most of the past 25 years, international economic analysts have, uh, have been able to rely on a couple of things. First, uh, that East, East Asia and Pacific economies would grow at a faster rate than the rest of the world economy, uh, which has been true, you know, pretty, pretty consistently. There were some hiccups with the, East Asia, the uh, Asian financial crisis in uh, the late 90s and otherwise. But overall, there's, there's been very solid growth. The second thing that econ economists could count on was that Asia-Pacific economic policy tended to move very steadily uh, in, and consistently toward more openness and greater economic integration. The progress achieved, if you take this long view, is frankly stunning. Uh, whether you look at growth rates, but more importantly, look at the reduction in poverty, the creation of large and growing middle classes, uh, it is uh, one, of the, one of the most remarkable performances uh, from, a, from an economic development standpoint in all of human history. Uh, so there's lots, to, lots that has been achieved and will, uh, that, that continues to benefit uh, peace and security. Uh, but having said that, uh, today uh, it's not quite the same picture, and I think that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, today, I think the, the view of East Asia and the Pacific in terms of economic growth is still very positive. Uh, our, uh, our more, more uh, numerically inclined colleagues up the street at the Peterson Institute yesterday held their global economic forecast, and once again, East Asia and the Pacific looks to have, demonstrate stronger growth uh, in, over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, than either Europe or the United States. However, uh, 
there's, there have been questions raised about the degree to which convergence, which has occurred between developing and developed economies over the past 25 years, will continue and, and at what pace it will continue. So there's, there are questions being raised. Likewise, on the policy front, uh, there, are, there are, I think, important questions about whether economic integration in East Asia and the Pacific will continue or whether, in fact, it's reversible. There have been some, you know, some large, important economies uh, in uh, East Asia and the Pacific who have moved in a direction that's frankly contrary and sort of less liberal uh, than in the past. Uh, uh, I would note uh, the large, the, the proliferation of local content requirements, uh, many of the policies, uh, Indonesia being a single, a, a, not the only example, but a, uh, an interesting example of sort of Indonesia first policies, local content requirements, uh, uh, decisions to no longer enforce uh, uh, or, or abide by bilateral investment treaties, a number of, of, of moves that, while well, headline by headline, they didn't amount to much, but you put it all together, there's, I think, an open question about the degree to which East Asia and Pacific economic integration will continue and at what pace. So I think that's the theme that I would like to set for today's conference. We're delighted to have a, a terrific panel of experts to discuss these and other issues. Uh, uh, you have your, their biographies in front of you, so I won't read them, but I will introduce them all together and then let, let them speak in turn. We'll start with Dr. Bob Wang. Uh, Bob is a senior official uh, for APEC for the U.S. Department of State. He'll be followed with another U.S. perspective, Ed Britswa, who's director of APEC Affairs uh, at the U.S. Office of U.S. Trade Representative. Following that, uh, Mr. Toshi Sakamoto, Deputy Director General for Trade Policy in the Trade Policy Bureau of the Minister of Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry of Japan. Uh, think of, uh, of uh, Mr. Sakamoto as the, uh, as the senior official for both APEC and East Asia Summit, and uh, he's at least representing that role. That's part of his portfolio today. Finally, we'll hear from the business community. Uh, one of the great things about East Asia and the Pacific and its economic integration efforts is the degree to which they incorporate business views and the perspective of, of enterprise. Uh, Dorothy Dwoskin is uh, Senior Director of Global Trade Policy for Microsoft, but in, in her role today, uh, she is Vice Chair of, the, for, of Policy uh, for the National Center for APEC. National Center for APEC is the Secretariat for the U.S. Asia, Asia Pacific Business uh, uh, Council members uh, and uh, very active in APEC matters uh, for almost 25 years. In any case, with that, uh, to, thanks for in advance for the panel, and let me uh, turn it over to Bob. Uh, thank you very much. But just wondering before I start, uh, I think this podium is blocking my uh, the view on the left side, and wondering if at some point someone can come in, maybe move the podium if if possible. But if not, don't worry about it. But um, so if I was going to give the left side a little bit more uh, equal treatment. Uh, anyway, let me start uh, in the interest of time to just say that uh, speaking about APEC directly, that. Um, that uh, this year, I believe, will be a good year. I've only been doing this for about a year, and uh, so I think this is a good year for me. In any case, <laughs> it's only been one year experience. But I think it's been a good year, and part of it is because, for one thing, uh, we know that President Obama this year will almost definitely attend APEC. Uh, he hadn't done it in the last two years, so at the very least this year we will, uh, I think, have him in Beijing, because he's also, as I think most of you know, going to be doing a bilateral uh, immediately after the, uh, the, uh, the APEC uh, leaders meeting, after which he will then go on, he has a very long schedule, he'll be going on to Burma for the uh, EAS, as well as the ASEAN-US summit uh, meeting uh, in Burma, and then doing a bilateral with Burma as well. And then after that, he will be heading off to um, uh, Brisbane in Australia, uh, to do the G20 uh, in Brisbane and the 15th and the 16th. So he has a very long trip, and this is, I think this is extremely important because I think it gives, obviously, our highest leader a chance to engage directly with uh, Asia uh, in all aspects, first of all, bilaterally with China, with Burma, and so on, also regionally within EAS, as well as within APEC with 20 members in APEC, uh, 20 other members in APEC, uh, and also with the other uh, ASEAN members. And then finally, he goes to uh, Brisbane for a global agenda. So I think in this 
about seven or eight grueling trip, uh, the President, the Secretary, others will have a chance really to press forward and engage uh, the region uh, in uh, a lot of uh, issues across the board, from economics to politics, security, uh, and so on. So I think it's already starting out, to be, I think, to be a very good year, at least in terms of our engagement uh, with the region. So, uh, but in terms of the substance of APEC itself, um, uh, in terms of uh, 2014 working with China uh, and with the other, uh, essentially 20 other APEC economies, I would say, at least from my perspective, seriously, I think it, it is a good year. Uh, I'll let Ed here from uh, USTR talk a little bit more about the trade and investment uh, facets of APEC and what APEC has been doing this year. And I will focus on talking about essentially our work in trying to promote sustainable development and sustainable growth in APEC, as well as our work in trying to uh, increase regional um, a connectivity uh, within the APEC region, which of course, as you know, expands beyond the Pacific over to Peru, Chile, Mexico, uh, and so on. So we're doing a lot of, I think, good work on this. Uh, and in many ways, I think uh, I caught uh, part of uh, what uh, Prime Minister Rudd was saying. In, in many ways, I think this, this builds up the kind of cooperation that he talked about in terms of the regional architecture uh, of the region, uh, in terms of working together on many of these different issues. Uh, again, uh, let me just then very quickly, if you, if you don't mind, just go into the list of what we're actually doing, in, at least in terms of the sustainable development side uh, of our portfolio. Uh, there, I think you could probably divide it into uh, three different areas. Uh, first area would be environmental, I would say, uh, meaning that uh, with no, having lived in China for 10 years and other places, we know that sometimes growth actually brings with it terrible consequences in terms of air pollution, water, food safety, and so on and so forth. So we really think that it's important within APEC to start off knowing that there are issues that are going to come from fast growth. We need to, at the same time while we're growing, begin to look at the consequences of that. So uh, in APEC this year, uh, we, uh, at the Energy Ministerial in Beijing that I attended in August, and Dan Poneman, our Deputy Secretary, was there. We uh, set a target of trying to renew, double the uh, share of renewable fuels uh, by 2030 in the energy mix within APEC itself. Uh, we announced and talked about fossil fuel subsidy peer reviews that, uh, that Peru has already completed. Uh, New Zealand will start right after the election, now that it's over. And uh, China and the United States have agreed to do fossil fuel subsidy peer reviews. Uh, with the goal of eventually removing a lot of the inefficient <clears throat> uh, subsidies for fossil fuel. Uh, and we're hoping that a few other countries will come in, or economies will come in in November to also announce that they will volunteer to do these, again, to try to promote in, in indirectly uh, renewable fuels uh, within the region uh, in terms of the environment. Uh, at the Oceans Ministerial we had in Xiamen uh, in August, uh, there we again came up and we translated a lot of our uh, objectives uh, within our Oceans Conference that Secretary Kerry held in, in a department uh, in June. Uh, we translated a lot of it in terms of getting more policy commitments to, for example, expand protected marine areas along the shores. The one thing that all APEC economies have in common is that we all border the Pacific. And so we're trying to expand the, the areas that are going to be protected. We uh, agreed to do, uh, re begin to remove uh, subsidies for fishing, to prevent excessive fishing, so to actually maintain sort of, you might say, manage uh, fishery, uh, take measures against uh, illegal fishing uh, uh, in the region. So all of these have essentially are in the environmental area that we uh, are trying to, I think, uh, we're able to emphasize this year. Uh, in the second area, I think that's going to be very important, and I think China is taking the lead on this as well, and that's anti-corruption. So this year, we uh, are going to, we endorsed it at the uh, Anti-Corruption uh, Transparency Working Group in Beijing uh, in August. And by, I, by November, I think we should have our leaders uh, essentially endorse what we call uh, APEC uh, principles on the prevention of bribery and the enforcement of bribery laws, anti-bribery laws. Uh, so this will be very similar to what OECD, uh, a little bit 
similar to what we're doing in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States. Uh, so this will be endorsed uh, as well as uh, a sort of uh, APEC general elements of uh, corporate comp effective corporate compliance programs, you know, this, to try to get the private sector as well to get involved in uh, reducing the uh, degree of corruption that is pervasive within the region. And we believe this is important for sustainable growth because if you have bribery, corruption, I think as China is finding out today, eventually it'll come back to bite you in terms of uh, the reaction of the people who are left out of the, of the, uh, the growth. So I think this is very key. Similarly, at the uh, SME ministerial that we had in Nanjing, there's a Nanjing declaration. Uh, uh, again, this is in September, early September. Uh, there we uh, agreed to move ahead on uh, sort of codes of ethics for two specific sectors, medical devices as well as biopharmaceutical. And there we're trying to, the goal is to by 2015, double the number of associations throughout the APEC region uh, that will sign on and adopt these codes of ethics in terms of how you deal in, in, in the health sector. Uh, and uh, they will set up an ethics uh, portal, a uh, web portal, ethics portal that people can have access to. And lastly, the, in, in terms of the area of, um, I would say, inclusive growth, uh, we're very much focused. This is something that uh, Secretary Clinton uh, started in the, in the U.S. year in 2011. Uh, on women economic empowerment. And there we're trying to uh, do many things. Japan is taking the lead on this uh, in many ways. Uh, for example, getting examples of 50 companies that have best practices for trying to make it easier, facilitate uh, sort of women participation within the companies, uh, health I issues involved there. Uh, in the, on our part, we're trying to essentially uh, we have set up a dashboard of uh, data indicators where we'll begin to measure uh, the sort of women participation in the economy throughout the APEC economies, and then start, start to set targets, uh, look at gap analysis where we can improve, uh, look at best practices. And we're also setting up a portal or a, a electronic platform uh, that would uh, essentially bring all of the uh, women uh, entrepreneurs within the APEC economies together in this electronic platform to begin to have you might say critical mass in terms of working together, uh, procurement, uh, sort of uh, supply chain procurement for looking at women enterprises throughout the region, uh, training, uh, ac access to finance market, uh, and so on. So uh, many of these areas we're working on. Last thing uh, on connectivity. Uh, how much time do I have? Two, two more? Okay. A minute, or, okay. Uh, on connectivity, uh, we, um, of course, uh, we'll come up this year with a uh, connectivity blueprint uh, within APEC that will essentially establish certain targets uh, in terms of physical infrastructure, in terms of regulatory uh, convergence to try to get institutional convergence in terms of uh, trying to get uh, regulations more harmonized across the region, and finally in terms of people to people, uh, tourism, in terms of finding different ways to increase that, flows, education. Uh, within and among the different uh, APEC economies. And in this context, uh, this year, APEC will be establishing uh, what we call an APEC scholarship and internship program. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have about 100 of these uh, to be announced, uh, where we'll try to get, uh, try to focus on getting students from, especially APEC developing economies, to have a chance to go to other economies to either train or to study on scholarships that, in our case, will be provided by companies. In the case of Chinese Taipei, in the case of China, Australia, it will be more government-provided uh, uh, scholarships. So we think all of this will bring together, uh, in terms of the APEC region, a greater connectivity. And, and the last thing, just to echo what uh, Prime Minister Rudd was saying, uh, in my one year here working on APEC, I find that working uh, with my counterparts like Sakamoto-san and others, uh, I've, I really found that just meeting four or five times a year in terms of the quarterly SOMs at the ABAC meetings, getting together, that we actually have, I, I feel this, uh, built up a camaraderie of group of people, especially at the working level, uh, who work together with each other every quarter and meet and intersessionally. And that, in many ways, is building up, I think, this community in APEC over the last 25 years that I think will be you know, not a specific outcome for this year, but will be, I think, in the long term,
uh, extremely important for, the, uh, for Asia. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Ed, tell us about the, uh, the, the trade stuff, as it were. Thanks, Scott. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about the trade stuff uh, <laughs> and the investment stuff, because that's an important part of APEC, too. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today and to talk to you about our trade and investment agenda in APEC. And my remarks will be limited uh, purely to APEC, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions in that regard. But I, I'd like to talk to you about our expectations for our trade and investment initiatives in APEC this year. Uh, and I, I think, like Bob said, we've got a lot of really good, interesting work going on in APEC on a wide array of issues. And many of these issues are broadly supported. Many have been pushed forward by our host, China. Uh, and China and the United States are cooperating on a lot of things. And I think it's, a, it's been a very interesting, at least personally, it's been very interesting to watch China uh, lead a multilateral effort uh, in, in the span of one year and to see where that ends up. So we've got one month before we are in Beijing again for the APEC leaders and ministers meetings. And I'd like to describe for you some of the specific initiatives uh, that we're working on. Um, but uh, before I go into that, what I'd like to say is that uh, every single year we have a, a, an overarching priority that we ensure that APEC remains the premier uh, economic forum in the Asia Pacific for multilateral cooperation on trade and investment issues. That's a, a significant priority for us because we think APEC can do great things and we want to make sure that it continues to do great things on trade and investment in a very concrete way. Uh, when the United States hosted APEC in 2011, uh, we fostered and we achieved a very results-oriented environment and we delivered a lot of meaningful and concrete results and outcomes to our stakeholders. And these included results on regulatory coherence, green growth, uh, and a broad array of trade and investment initiatives. Uh, and rather than discussing our visions for APEC, we developed an agenda that was very action-oriented and focused on the tangible things that APEC could do to promote regional economic integration. So every year, we work along these same lines. We worked uh, with our hosts in the past on these lines, uh, for example, in, in the Russia year in 2012, where we agreed on uh, the APEC list of environmental goods, which was a significant achievement building on the commitment to reduce tariffs on environmental goods uh, to 5% or less by uh, 2015. And in the Indonesia year, in 2013, we created a new fund in APEC for improving supply chain for performance through capacity building. This was a very concrete initiative. Uh, and, and this year, we're doing the same with China. We're trying to make any outcomes on trade and investment as tangible and concrete as possible. Uh, and let me go back to environmental goods. I think this is the most tangible example uh, of a historic commitment in APEC to actually do trade liberalization. And, and this is also an example of how APEC is contributing to the multilateral trading system because, as many of you know, we just launched a new set of negotiations at the WTO on an environmental goods agreement. Uh, the inspiration for that was the APEC list of environmental goods. And we're, we're hopeful that we can really expand on that APEC list, implement the commitments in that APEC list, and, uh, and, and really create a, a new initiative at the WTO that, that really is meaningful for all of our stakeholders. Um, so uh, in terms of our specific initiatives, um, you know, we, we, I'd like to focus on a couple of areas. Uh, good regulatory practices, supply chain performance, and um, also environmental goods and services. I'll describe exactly what we expect to achieve this year. <laughs> on that, and then global value chains, which is a very new area for, for APEC, and I think it's a, a very interesting area where APEC could do more uh, concrete work in the future. Um, and all of these areas fall under China's priority of advancing regional economic integration. So we tried to work very hard with the host to ensure that what we're trying to pursue on trade and investment uh, also falls under their priority. Uh, good regulatory practices. Uh, this is an initiative that's near and dear to my heart as a former non-tariff barrier negotiator. Uh, we have a responsibility in APEC, not just to address current barriers, but also prevent barriers from occurring. And one of those ways, one of the ways we can do that is to help regulators actually regulate better, to pr produce more effective, legitimate, higher quality regulations, and to help regulators actually acquire better information about the proposed regulations so they, they don't turn into barriers in the future. Uh, so there's three good regulatory practices that APEC focused on, and this really started in our host year. Internal coordination of regulatory work, which is like how 
uh, agencies communicate with each other about a proposed regulation, assessing the impact of regulations, and conducting public consultations. And I, I want to focus on that last one, because what we're trying to do this year is create a new set of actions that APEC economies could take voluntarily to improve how they're actually conducting public co consultations and working with their stakeholders, acquiring information. Uh, these are things like doing early notice of proposed rules, uh, setting a specific time frame, like 30 to 60 days for accepting public comment, uh, building a web portal at the center of government instead of a regulator by regulator approach for doing public consultations. So we're really trying to offer very concrete ways that uh, regulators in the Asia Pacific could, could do public consultations and uh, acquire better information. Uh, supply chain performance. In 2010, APEC leaders set out a very specific goal, improve supply chain performance by 10% by 2015 in terms of reduction of time, cost, and uncertainty. That's a very, uh, I think, ambitious goal, and I think we're on track to achieve it, but we've tried to uh, come up with new ways we can uh, work on that goal. And this year, we agreed on a capacity building plan to help developing economies uh, actually improve supply chain performance and overcome any obstacles they face. And we think this is a great way uh, to help economies, especially developing economies, implement their future trade facilitation agreement obligations. And these are very tangible pro uh, projects that we're doing, expedited shipments, pre-arrival processing, issuing advanced rulings. We're gonna help developing economies at the e economy level instead of doing workshops and information sharing exercises, actually implement these types of programs. We also created a new body in APEC called the APEC Alliance for Supply Chain Connectivity. This is a public-private body that will help us move forward these capacity building efforts. So we're trying to leverage the expertise and the resources of supply chain experts all over the world to help us with these projects. And trade ministers endorsed both of these initiatives back in uh, May in Qingdao. So these, the, we'll, we're gonna recognize this, this progress in the Leaders Week meetings. A environmental goods and services. As I mentioned, uh, we have this historic commitment, but what is the foremost priority this year is affirming that commitment, ensuring that economies actually implement that commitment next year. It's a huge priority for APEC, it's a huge priority for the United States, but we're also seeking that APEC launch new work on addressing non-tariff measures that impact trade and environmental goods and services, because if we don't, the tariff reductions won't be as meaningful. Uh, finally, global value chains. Global value chains is, like I said, it's a very new uh, area for APEC. This is about how you add value from the inception of an idea to the delivery of a product. Uh, uh, as we all know, uh, production uh, of, of finalized goods uh, happens in, in various ways and in various economies. And I think the CSIS folks have uh, drawn a lot of attention to this. So APEC actually has a set of a sort of uh, policy principles on global value chains. And uh, they include things like the importance of services, the importance of investment, the importance of SMEs. What we're focusing on in the United States is how we can actually address trade and investment barriers that impact global value chains. And I think the primary example that we're focusing on, and we want uh, to actually do more work on this next year, we want an instruction on this, is how do we actually understand the uh, uh, phenomenon of localization requirements, localization barriers to trade, and as Scott mentioned, uh, I think a big example of this is the requirement that you keep data centers locally. Um, you know, this is a concern that we have all around the world, and I think APEC could do great work in helping us understand why economies are doing this, and what alternatives that are very trade and investment friendly can we provide to economies instead of using these uh, requirements. Um, so I, I know there's a lot more to discuss on trade and investment, but I think these are some really good examples of what we're trying to achieve this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Sir. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks, uh, CISI colleagues, for inviting me. I'm really excited about this opportunity to talk about APEC and the EAS. Um, in APEC, the United States is the closest ally of Japan, and both Bob and Ed are good friends of mine and are forming part of the APEC community. And since Bob and Ed uh, thoroughly explained uh, this year's APEC agenda, uh, including uh, trade stuff, uh, I will be just pointing out uh, Japan's priority uh, in this year's APEC agenda. On trade stuff, uh, Japan is uh, promoting, uh, putting forward uh, 
uh, specific proposal on services. Unlike trading goods, uh, trading services uh, have be, has been left out, kind of, kind of left out in the APEC discussions. So we are now focusing this year services uh, such as uh, manufacturing related services and environment services, both proposals are co-sponsored by the United States. And the next year, Philippines will be hosting the uh, APEC uh, leaders uh, meetings. As you know, in Philippines, uh, they have a very strong and a very competitive service industries. So we intend to come up with a concrete action plan next year in Philippine years. On sustainable development front, uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, we are now implementing uh, uh, 50 um, companies, exemplary companies, in terms of the empowering women. And 50 companies will be, uh, the name of the 50 companies will be announced in the Leaders Week, and which include the seven U.S. companies, so please look forward to it. On the connectivity, uh, Japan emphasized the importance of quality of infrastructure, such as life cycle cost and environmental performance and the safety, including resilience to natural disasters. So those are the epic uh, priorities for Japan. Let me turn to EAS, because the name of this session is EAS slash EPEC. I think many US people consider EPEC is for economic matters, whereas EAS is for political or security issues. I slightly disagree with that observation, because EAS, uh, economic minister's meeting, uh, was formalized last year. They started some um, substantial discussions uh, with the input from ERIA, E-R-I-A, which stands for uh, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, they are doing some analysis on industry, industry cluster uh, because the business activities in ASEAN is now uh, cross-border. Uh, for example, a Japanese automotive company in Thailand uh, has now shifted its labor-intensive process to neighboring countries like Lao PDR and Cambodia. Uh, they produce labor-intensive products in such countries, then ship back to Thailand mother factories on a daily basis. As such, uh, Japanese uh, business activities in Mekong region is really cross-border, and the uh, area is now doing research work how to develop such cross-border industry cluster in the future. And also next year, uh, area will come up with a recommendation how infrastructure should be developed in ASEAN. They did that research about five years ago, but next year, uh, they will revise uh, such a study in order to provide input to uh, EAS as well as uh, ASEAN Summit. In this regard, I would very much appreciate if uh, U.S. businesses are interested in this work and provide the necessary input. Um, let me turn to uh, also RCEP, RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This is not EAS per se, uh, because uh, EAS are uh, 18 countries, uh, whereas uh, RS RCEP is negotiated by 16 countries, uh, not included. Uh, US is not included there. RCEP is another mega FTAs other than TPP and TTIP, uh, which, uh, in, which is negotiated by 16 countries, ASEAN 10 countries, and six uh, dialogue partners of ASEAN. Uh, six dialogue partners have, have its own uh, ASEAN plus one uh, FTA already, and 16 countries amount to 48% of global population, 29% uh, of global GDP and global trade, and 45% of Japanese export, whereas that figure is 30% for TPP. People frequently ask me the question, what's the difference between TPP and RCEP? Uh, from my perspective, my personal view is that the TPP is for rule settings, whereas RCEP is to strengthen the regional supply chain. 
based upon the business reality. Uh, since you may not have much information on RCEP, but taking this opportunity, I would like to briefly uh, explain what merit the United States business communities can get from RCEP. RCEP negotiating a lot of things, uh, not only trading goods, but also rule makings, such as NTB, non-tariff barriers, uh, TBT, SPS, uh, trade facilitation, uh, investment protection, uh, competition, and uh, intellectual property rights. All these rule making, if agreed, will be applied to universally. It's really difficult to apply domestic policies on these areas differently from uh, you know, uh, RCEP countries versus non-RCEP countries. And also, if U.S. company establish uh, subsidiaries in one of RCEP countries, uh, that company uh, can benefit from a market access commitment of services under RCEP. So there is a lot of benefit uh, for U.S. business communities uh, if RCEP is successfully concluded. And the, I believe that the United States are very much interested in e-commerce, uh, both in the context of uh, TPP and uh, other international fora. And in this regard, I am very grateful for the publication by U.S. ASEAN Business Council, uh, which celebrated the 30th anniversary last night. They published a report called Beyond AEC, ASEAN Economic Community 2015. This is really a um, remarkable uh, piece of work. It's a policy recommendation for ASEAN SME, uh, SME compet competitiveness. In that uh, policy recommendation, they focused on e-commerce, uh, which is very helpful for RCEP negotiations. Actually, I am now drafting um, RCEP non-paper on e-commerce. And I took the liberty of uh, putting some uh, paragraphs uh, from their recommendation in Japanese non-paper on e-commerce. It was really helpful. And also AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, um, this is much more advanced, uh, advanced effort than many of you think. On tariff matters, uh, ASEAN six countries eliminated 99% tariff, tariff lines. Uh, CLMV uh, will be eliminated as 93% by 2015, and the remaining seven will be also eliminated by 2018. And ASEAN FTA is one of the most utilized third-party FTA by Japanese companies and uh, national single window and also service liberalization are, the all, almost, uh, are, are also a very important uh, undertakings uh, in AEC. So in sum, uh, next year, 2015, is very important for EAS and ASEAN uh, because RCEP is uh, supposed to finish the negotiation by the end of 2015 and AEC will be established uh, 20, 2015, and the post-2015 vision of ASEAN community will be developed. Uh, so take it, so I, I believe that it would be nice if Japanese business communities and the U.S. business communities uh, jointly speak up uh, for, for your business interest on these, uh, on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you. Dorothy. Thanks. Thank you, Scott, um, and uh, thanks for um, asking us to have a bit of a business uh, view on the panel. Um, since it's baseball season, I guess I get to, be, to bat cleanup um, today. I can say go Nats. Um, so I actually have sort of three hats um, today. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I am um, a vice chair of the National Center for APEC focused on um, its policy work. Um, I've uh, at Microsoft working on uh, global trade and economic issues, and like a few other um, souls that I see around the room, I'm one of those um, recovering uh, trade negotiators, and that's a hat that I don't ever seem to be able to take off. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the, the National Center. So we're um, 53 uh, companies uh, in the United States uh, across a wide range of um, sectors. And our mission really is to facilitate the private sector's um, involvement in APEC. As Scott mentioned, we um, 
provide uh, a, a secretariat to the private sector for um, APEC uh, issues throughout the year and uh, support the three presidentially appointed uh, advisory co committee members who serve with uh, the 20 other um, APEC economy uh, representatives. We're always looking for more U.S. companies um, that want to join. I don't get a commission or anything, but you're always welcome to join. So what I thought I'd do is, is maybe talk a little bit about sort of the business viewpoint. And we've been very fortunate in um, uh, the past number of years that one of our knowledge partners um, and a member of the National Center, um, PwC, has done a survey of um, CEOs and business leaders in the region uh, to prepare for um, these uh, uh, annual CEO summits. And I wanted to share with you some of the high-level findings that we, um, the PwC announced last year. I think they're pretty consistent with, with previous years, and it gives you sort of a good sense of where the business community is on all of these issues. Because I know, having taken a lot of our execs to um, these meetings, it's like, what does this really mean? And is this going to really affect my bottom line? And this is a lot of fluffy stuff in a 15-page declaration. And how does this actually affect um, business? So the PwC survey um, was pretty interesting last year um, in terms of saying that, that there was a lot of confidence um, in growth and that, in fact, there was a lot of um, emphasis on domestic consumption-driven um, growth and more attention to um, middle-income consumers. And what that meant, if, um, according to PwC, is that you know, the nature of investment in the region is changing. It's going from beyond just manufacturing capacity expansion to really looking at new products um, and investments, for example, in, in services. That, so that was one finding. Second finding was that the partnership strategies um, uh, of the companies uh, seem to be changing. There's more of an interest in local partners. Um, this is helping um, with the skills and talent gap, um, and it's also helping more to capitalize on uh, local middle income demand. So um, I said I work for Microsoft. Obviously, this was a really um, happy finding for us. Um, there was an emphasis in uh, the report about data, and that data is at the heart of customer demand and, and business opportunity. And in fact, they said that, that there are four market forces that are individually and collectively uh, redefining customer demand and business opportunity. Mobile computing, cloud computing, social technology, and the emergence of uh, intelligent uh, devices. And it pointed to uh, work that needs to be done, obviously, in the area of data privacy, something that where APEC has already done a lot of work, and that a growing uh, number of business leaders um, identify that the legal frameworks for cross-border data flows is really becoming an emerging barrier for their companies to benefit um, more uh, fr from the digital uh, economy. So uh, kind of music to our ears, that's been an issue that you know, a lot of um, the folks in the National Center have been, been looking at. We, for our part, have looked at um, the importance of technology, particularly for um, small and medium-sized enterprise. And there is a pretty strong correlation between those who have adopted technology and more open to technology have become more successful, more integrated as uh, cloud computing becomes more pervasive, there's more opportunity for um, others to um, join the global value chain um, development. So the fourth area that they talked about was the need for f further improvements in infrastructure in order for business to grow. Ed's mentioned this. Um, there's you know, been a lot of uh, work pointed out, to, out on the need for more work on power supplies, um, dealing with uh, clogged transit networks, um, lowering the cost of, of broadband, um, and really putting an emphasis on public-private sector infrastructure models. Again, one of the findings was that lifting regulatory barriers um, is really um, essential um, because we really need to, do, to reduce costs in, in this area. Um, another finding was that inconsistent regulatory um, and other standards are really a key um, blocker to business growth around the region. That uh, different rules for products and services are really increasing complexity and the ability to scale um, in the region. 
Um, and this brings in other disciplines, for example, such as IP and corporate governance. So I think all of these, these, these findings are consistent with the work that the government is doing. The one thing I think that ties all of this together is that in the, in the um, findings, the um, business leaders were asked about their um, view of trade negotiations and how this was going to help. Um, and, you know, was it going to help or was the creation of blocks going to um, create problems? And I think the finding was really that there is a lot of uncertainty, but it would be very important that no matter how all of these um, uh, approaches um, are developed, that they really have to look to business um, to make sure that they are not inadvertently um, uh, adding uh, new barriers. and. Um, Toshi and I had a good conversation yesterday about um, RCEP and, and our interests, and um, I'm pretty confident that Japan's going to push for a very high value of, um, agreement in RCEP that uh, is going to help uh, um, raise the gold standard. Um, with him in the lead, I'm sure we'll get a really good uh, agreement from that. We'll, we'll watch what he's doing. But in terms of the National Center for APEC, we actually have a lot of um, work programs and projects underway. and I, really just want to flag those for you. We are doing something on uh, infrastructure investment. We did help create a checklist um, to really um, identify uh, for governments um, uh, the sort of essentials um, to help uh, um, deal with um, making the public-private sector uh, investment infrastructure really a, a, a reality. Um, it pointed to, for example, the need for creating um, uh, business-friendly FDI environment. I think that goes to a lot of the issues that Ed raised, a lot of interagency coordination and really some country benchmarking. We have started at the National Center and should have um, for the um, meetings in China um, another uh, contribution on the digital economy really focusing on cross-border data flows and really looking at how business takes advantage of cross-border data flows or should, um, and that it's really not just a technology issue, that um, anybody who is competing in the global economy really needs to be able to have data cross borders. And then that gets you into a whole conversation about um, privacy, uh, security, and um, how all of these issues fit together. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we also um, have done quite a lot of work in the health area. Um, this year, we've spent some time um, looking at the, um, the costs and productivity losses that are caused by um, preventable health conditions. Um, they call, they're called NCDs or non-communicable diseases. Um, this study is actually going to be reviewed um, by um, leaders, and there's also some work that's been done um, in the health sector, as Ed mentioned, with respect to the supply chain. We've done some work um, on finance. We have an Asia-Pacific Financial Forum um, and really looking at integrated financial markets. So that's what we're doing as APEC. We obviously um, have been uh, working very closely with the U.S. government. It was mentioned already, the women's empowerment and the creation of regional um, entrepreneurial networks. Um, we obviously um, are very supportive of the expansion of the Information Technology Agreement. For many of you, you know that's pretty near and dear my own heart. Um, the WTO says that, uh, you know, for all the time that you leave um, uh, the ITA undone, you basically are leaving uh, $2 billion of uh, GDP growth annually on the table. So that um, should be um, a good incentive to have a very meaningful and expansive um, and balanced, I guess, is the other buzzword, um, uh, ITA um, concluded. And I think APEC played a really important role in Manila in 1996 when we did the first um, ITA agreement. And I think, uh, you know, uh, China has an opportunity to help show leadership so that the negotiators can go back to, to Geneva and put the, uh, the deal back together. Um, Ed uh, mentioned um, the work on good regulatory practices. Um, that is obviously something that the private sector here in the U.S. has pushed very hard. There are a lot of disciplines that are already agreed to in the WTO which need to be expanded. We've had a lot of learnings from our own free trade agreements and the work there. So um, we think uh, that that's been a, a, a really good exercise in 
um, consultation and development um, of the issues with, uh, with the U.S. government. Ed mentioned the goals with respect to um, supply chain connectivity, and uh, a lot of our members are front and center in promoting the um, trade facilitation agreement um, that um, we hope will come to fruition um, in the WTO, and it's great to see that the government is working all of the angles to try and make sure that our partners in APEC are really ready to implement um, the um, trade facilitation agreement. We've also done a lot of work on food security partnerships. The mining ministerial is a good example of um, something where the private sector really pushed to have a discussion about mining, and we were able um, to have the first ministerial meeting. There's obviously been a huge number of um, uh, projects on, on the whole question of energy and energy security. And then, you know, um, the National Center um, and its membership are very engaged on what I would call the bread and butter issues, sort of the trade and investment issues. Um, there was reference to the emerging problems um, on local content, um, and it's not just data centers. It's um, if you want to be able to sell your product in a market, countries are going back to the notion that you have to actually establish a manufacturing facility. This is obviously, since I and we're recovering trade negotiator is actually a problem because we did a lot in the WTO to reinforce um, the, uh, the obligations that say that that's highly illegal. So we're going to have to find a way to have a conversation, a more serious conversation in the region because it's becoming a problem and it's becoming a problem for a lot of those um, uh, APEC members who have attracted manufacturing and that they're not going to be able to scale because there are s demands for uh, local manufacturing. So it's, you know, localization of data centers is, is one issue. There's this myth that people think that if you put a data center in country that it's going to be a huge uh, job creator. It's not. There are lots of um, economic reasons for looking at where to put data centers, um, not the least of which are some of the energy concerns that, that people have. Um, obviously, there's going to continue to be work on the free trade area of the Asia Pacific and work um, in studying uh, APEC's contribution uh, to that. And then, um, as I mentioned before, the SMEs. So we're looking ahead to what we think um, will be a really good um, meeting in Beijing. Um, will it be as historic as 2001? Um, there was a lot of activity about China's joining the WTO then and the run-up to Doha, um, and uh, we'll have to see how the issues sort out. Uh, we're very excited um, and already working um, uh, for next year with our um, friends in the Philippines um, to really uh, see if we can't make a, um, a, an even bigger push on the private sector involvement throughout the APEC year um, as in the run-up to the leaders' meeting. Um, NCAPEC's making its contributions, and like I said, we're 53 strong. We'd love to be even stronger, and if you have an interest um, in uh, the National Center, we'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dorothy, and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, what I'd like to do now is open the floor for questions. Uh, there are three simple rules for questioning, okay? The first is, when, when you recognize, wait for the microphone. Uh, as you recall from the, the opening remarks, we have a large online audience, and they won't hear a word you have to say until the microphone gets to you and it is turned on. So wait for the, for the microphone. Second, uh, start by stating your name and, and the organization you represent. And third, what I call the Alex Trebek rule, please make sure your question is in the form of a question. No statements, please. Uh, so uh, with those, let me start. Yes, ma'am. Microphone will be here shortly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jane. I'm from Taiji Media. Uh, my question is about China is pushing the FTAAP in the coming APEC meeting or, or the uh, feasibility study for the agreement. So from your perspective, from the business, from Japan, from USTR's perspective, how do you see the prospect of this agreement? And for Dr. Wang, uh, you mentioned about the enhancing construction of uh, infrastructure and, and uh, connectivity. Could you elaborate more about what does this mean? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, officially, I'll say uh, you should direct that question to our press office, but. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, I will, I'll, I'll give you a very brief answer on this. So I think this, this question was very much litigated by trade ministers at their meeting in Qingdao. There was no consensus at that time on the feasibility study proposal by China, uh, and nor was there a question on setting a deadline. Um, but there was a lot of support for APEC's contribution to the realization of an FTAP, and I think that's the way Dorothy framed it. APEC is a contributor. Uh, it, it does things like capacity building, information sharing on existing and ongoing RTAs and FTAs. Uh, it's done analysis in the past, uh, but what it's not is a, a negotiation body, and I think uh, our expectation is that APEC will remain as a contributor. And that's, that, that should be what happens actually at the leaders' meeting. On the uh, construction question, uh, uh, in terms of connectivity blueprint, uh, the key thing now to note is that, uh, as you know, ADB studies have uh, study had uh, indicated that there's about eight trillion dollars worth of sort of demand for construction, infrastructure construction in the region in Asia, and uh, and our view is that in the final analysis, the private sector really will have to step in to invest to actually build the infrastructure, whether it's power stations or railroads or ports, whatnot. So what we're doing within APEC, led by Australia, uh, by the way, is to actually create a pilot center. Right now it's been created in Jakarta, but we're trying to expand this to different areas where working with ABEC as well is to provide uh, essentially advice uh, on a checklist, for example, on how to actually improve the investment uh, environment in terms of being able to attract private sector investment. So there are, there are certain kinds of regulations that block this, there are certain kinds of guarantees that are needed, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, essentially Australia, for example, is putting a finance minister, ministry official in Jakarta to work with their people to look at their investment regulations. And, and we're hoping to do this again across uh, the APEC economies among those who really need, want to have infrastructure investment. So that's what we're doing because public financing is not going to be sufficient in the in, you know in the long term. You really need private sector to step in, and the way to do it is improving the investment environment. Um, I just would like to add a few words on EPTAP since you mentioned the Japanese business uh, Japanese business community. Um, the Japan has a strong ownership. Uh, on FTAP because the pathway to FTAP was agreed in 2010 in Yokohama Leaders Summit, uh, which uh, set out how, how APEC should try or should help establish FTAP. As Ed said, APEC is contributor, or as put in Yokohama Declaration, APEC is incubator for realizing FTAP. APEC is not a negotiation forum. Uh, we need to have, we need to understand the clear distinction on that. But, you know, as, as you mentioned, there is a um, debate whether uh, we call analytical work feasibility study or not. Uh, I think, uh, but what I want to emphasize is that all APEC economy, 21 economies, are strongly united in the determination to realize FTAP. Thank you. Thank you. I would also note that, it, that FTAP has really been a, uh, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific has been a commonly agreed political goal, I think as far back as the Sydney meeting in 2006, if I remember right. Um, if Prime Minister Rudd were still here, he could correct me. But, <laughs> but so it's, it's been a longstanding political goal. To my mind, it's fully consistent with the Bogor goals. Uh, in many ways, and, and represents a represents a, a, an important aspiration. How it's actually executed is yet to be determined, as the panelists have said. Uh, but but I do think it's it's important to recognize that, and and, and China's uh, emphasis on uh, on FTAP is 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 wholly consistent with the APEC leaders' meetings, uh, at least in the past uh, six or seven years. So thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Did you? Good morning, thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Scott McDonald, uh, United States Marine Corps Strategic Initiatives Group. Uh, leading off that comment, sir, and stepping back towards our, our theme of Asian architecture, how do TPP and FTAP through APEC, how do we step back and use these structures in order to build an, an Asia Pacific that is more welcome both for trade and security 
for all partners in the Asia Pacific. In other words, we've talked a lot about specific free trade um, initiatives, which are all to the good. More freedom, more faster is more better. But how do we make that into an architecture uh, tool? Thank you. I'm happy to talk about the, the, what we're doing in APEC, but I think for questions on TPP, uh, please direct you to the, the press office. Thanks. <laughs> I do have a general comment. Uh, you know, I, I think just again, harking back, by the way, hi, we, we served in Taiwan together, right? Yeah, I suddenly <laughs> recognized you. Yeah, but anyway, uh, I think generally, like, harking back to what Kevin Rudd, uh, Prime Minister Rudd was saying, uh, the globalization part and then the you know, ethno-nationalism part, I think the idea is that if you promote trade in whatever form, as you have more interaction, more trade, more interdependence, and so on, that by itself is the architecture that essentially uh, binds people together and uh, reduces the sort of the ethno-nationalist uh, sort of tendencies that sometimes occurs in the form of perhaps protectionism in trade. But that's, I think, the, the point. The point is to open the borders, trade with each other, have interdependence, and I think that will create the type of stability that we need in this region. Thanks. With the, uh, with the multiple paths toward FTAP, I think it's important for economies to recognize that their interests lie in fewer, not more, solutions along the way. This is a point that, uh, that Matt Goodman and I uh, discussed at last year's conference. We, we published a, a short report on this. But you know, making these agreements interoperable step by step is, I think, a real, a practical way forward that for me and, 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 and Matt, as we looked at this, is strongly in the interest of the countries. Uh, a year ago, there was a lot of talk about whether RCEP and TPP were in conflict. And the point I made at the time the question came up was there are seven economies that are parties to both RCEP and TPP. It's strongly in those seven economies' interests to make sure that the requirements are as similar as possible. Their, their own industries want that. Their own, their own economic operators would find that to be appealing. Ultimately, that's the kind of the way you solve this. It's not, it's not necessarily a straight line. It's not all that direct. But step by step, you can get closer to integration by recognizing the underlying incentives. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Really? Uh, yes, ma'am. Jane Nakano with CSIS Energy and National Security Program. Thank you so much for the great presentations. My question is a little more at the 30,000 feet level, but pretty much following uh, up on uh, what Dr. Wong said. Uh, so there is now the, um, the new development bank that's, that's finally sort of signed off uh, in July. And then now there's a proposal to have this Asia Infrastructure Development uh, Bank. I'd like to hear your, uh, the panel view, uh, panel uh, sort of assessment or, or views on uh, what are the key drivers uh, behind these sort of like emergence of new potential architecture, economic architecture, and what that may do to the, uh, the influence of the existing ones, not just the, the regional ones like ADB, but then also IMF, the World Bank. And lastly, uh, well, I guess so that including what, what their influence may be on the global uh, sort of economic governance as we, know, um, as we know it today. Thanks so much. Hi. Uh, just quickly, I think uh, the, the driver for all of that, uh, the banks, and you, you talked about AIIB and, and so on and so forth, I think the driver clearly is the demand in this case, let's say AIIB, for infrastructure development in the region. I mean, there really is a need for that, especially in Southeast Asia, but in a lot of other parts of the, uh, of the region. So there is a need for it. And the main, uh, the main issue here that would be uh, something of concern to the United States and to others is that when we actually have these multilateral development banks that we actually do have established standards and that we try to meet the standards in terms of, again, I, I talked about this earlier, making sure we don't destroy the environment and when we go about uh, sort of investing in infrastructure, making sure that's the governance, there's no corruption uh, because construction industry generally has a number of issues in this area. And so we have to make sure it meets these standards of governance, transparency, environment, labor, uh, uh, and uh, procurement, and so on and so forth. That's basically our major concern. So I think as we move ahead with trying to build up different banks and, and whatnot to meet this, 
huge demand in the region. We just need to have to keep this in mind. Thanks. Is there a question over here? I'm sorry, the sight lines are such that, yes, sir, you're right in the, in the spotlight. <laughs> sorry. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Jimmy Tobai, and I work for Alibaba. Um, I have a question uh, about when you design policies for trade, it, it strikes me that usually what that really means is it's a business-to-business -business policy, but business-to-consumer trade is growing. And I'm wondering if, you know, do you, when you design policies, do you take, you know, that approach? Do you look at it like that? Or is it just mostly, you know, think about it as business-to-business -business trade? Thanks. Look, I, I think just as a general response, let me start by saying the world's changing really fast. And who's in international commerce and the scale of firms in international commerce is subject to very rapid change, and that's being recognized by policymakers. You know, for instance, you know, 30 years ago, you needed a certain scale to be able to find consumers of your product or service. Uh, you needed to, to be able to establish operations and ma make co contractual relationships with, say, freight forwarders or, or customs brokers or whatever it would be. You also needed to be able to uh, back up and have the financing uh, to carry off the, the agreement. You look at today's world, and, and your business is a good example of this, where an individual uh, can go on a site like Alibaba or eBay and find a product or service that they, they just had no way of, of knowing where it was or how to get to it uh, 10 or 20 years ago. I, I'm actually a, a, an eBay and Alibaba user because I've got a, a geriatric car in my garage that's very difficult to get parts for otherwise. So this kind of thing can be found when it, when it couldn't be found before. Second, logistics firms are operating as small-scale freight forwarders and customs brokers, UPS, Federal Express, uh, FedEx Express, uh, other companies, uh, essentially provide a service that you used to have to create on your own as a, as, a, as a firm or an industry. Third, relatively simple financing, electronic financing, is vital important to the, tr to the transaction and can now be done across borders. This changes the scale of operators in the international trading system. Uh, eBay's reported on this, the USITC has reported on this. Uh, so it's a very important dimension uh, and, it, and it really affects the way governments do consulting. But let me start with that and see if the panelists have anything to add. Uh, let me just add something very quickly. The answer is yes, uh, basically to your question, because we had an internet economy uh, actually session in uh, Beijing uh, just prior to Psalm 3 itself in August. And Alibaba was there, and they gave a good presentation, Uber, others. And the idea is to look at the impact of internet on, in terms of business to consumer, how that, what Scott says, how that improves it, but also to look at the policy uh, implications behind how do you facilitate that to allow SMEs and others to grow and to continue to facilitate trade between business and consumers. Uh, the one thing I, I would add to that, in, in terms of our APEC initiatives, I think we usually do have the consumer in mind. It's not just about the business. I mean, supply chain, for example, yes, many transactions happen between companies, but then to the day, we're trying to help uh, businesses actually reduce their time to market to get product to consumers more quickly, more efficiently, and more cheaply. So uh, consumers and business, businesses, we, everybody benefits from the work we do on supply chain. And I think many of the other initiatives we have in APEC uh, similarly, are, are, they're very expansive in that, in that regard. So um, I think your question was, you know, do you have policies to make sure that, um, that these, uh, there's a, a program of consultation? So, that, you know, I can speak for, you know, the experience in the United States um, where it's actually um, part of, um, uh, you know, Congress's uh, direction to the executive branch as far back as the Trade Act of 74, um, where there is a pretty extensive network of um, advisory committees, you know, and there is, but there is this um, idea of, you know, publishing notice and trying to um, get, uh, information um, from everywhere about the cost of taking a position. Um, and, and it gets to, I think, what Ed was talking about in terms of the good regulatory practices. You know, so 
in terms of developing a trade policy position, some of our best fights in the interagency back in the Stone Age when Geza and Charles were there um, was you sat down and you had different agencies that had responsibility for, let's say, consumer protection and some of the other issues to make sure that as you were putting a policy together that it actually worked, worked for everybody. Um, and uh, I mean, I think it's been a, it was a pretty successful model. It's gone through a couple of hiccups, but I think this, the code of this good regulatory practice um, makes it much more participatory and gives uh, the opportunity to make sure that um, there is this um, uh, better linkage between business and consumer. But I also think there's sort of a, um, a, a misunderstanding. I mean, a lot of the trade agreements don't tell you how a contract is to be written. So for example, in our business, um, you know, there are a lot of things in terms of protections with respect to privacy and security that don't really need to be written in a trade agreement, but they, there, there are sort of contractual um, conditions um, that um, address some of the, the, the customer needs. And you know, you set sort of a broad frame and then you let you let the business um, uh, move ahead. So I hope that helps. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Steve Hirsch. I'm a journalist who writes about Asia periodically. Uh, I want to ask a question that I think is only tangentially related to APEC, but I think is important to Asian architecture, uh, the economic aspects of it. And it's not a 30,000-foot question. Um, one thing that I never hear discussed uh, in Washington, uh, discussions of the uh, economic shape in Asia right now, is the impact uh, perspective of ASEAN uh, political and economic integration. Uh, and the reason I ask this is that I just got back from seven weeks in Southeast Asia, and the political and ec economic implications of this development are at the tip of everybody's tongue. Nobody is talking about the kinds of things we talk about here in Washington and Paris, trade negotiations, and so forth. They're talking about the massive implications that they see happening. And I'm wondering if the panel has any thoughts uh, on this. Thanks. Um, thank you for your question. As I mentioned in my uh, first remarks, uh, AEC, uh, ASEAN Economic uh, Community, Economic Integration of ASEAN, is really influential and very relevant to U.S. Uh, business uh, economies, and so is for all Japanese business communities. And as you know, the Japanese companies has made uh, a tons of investment, foreign direct investment in ASEAN countries for many, many years in the past. Uh, but these industries are largely uh, manufacturing industries, whereas uh, U.S. business are investing in ASEAN in other areas, such as service industries like IT, uh, financial industries, and uh, distribution. I think um, the both, both industry, and manufacturing and non-manufacturing, are very uh, important and influenced by the initiative of economic uh, integrations. And AEC, economic integration, has been progressed well for a uh, reduction of tariff, as I mentioned earlier. But when it comes to non-tariff barriers, uh, there is a wrong way to go. They clearly recognize the need to do much more to reduce uh, non-tariff non -tariff barriers uh, in ASEAN countries. And these issues are you know, relatively more important for probably non-manufacturing industries, I would say. So I think um, the US, uh, you know, I, I think US economy uh, should and could pay more attention to the development of AEC uh, because as I said, uh, next year is a key period, key year, uh, for, uh, because, uh, it, it, because ASEAN will be considering uh, the beyond 2015 vision to, to, to move further, to, 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 to move forward on um, AEC. 
I'm not quite sure whether I could answer to your question, but uh, it's my remarks. Thanks. That's a that's a great first approximation, but I thank you for taking taking the answer or have, having that answer. Uh, we're we're at an, at an end here, and so and before I thank the panel and uh, and and you, the audience, for your attention, let me let you know what happens next. This is the conference equivalent of the fourth inning stretch. <laughs> you now get to basically stretch your legs for about five minutes while we re reset the stage up here, and the next panel comes on. But before we do that, please join me in thanking our panelists for this morning's contribution. We'll reconvene uh, in five minutes. <laughs>